Hey everybody, um, back here again today continuing on and today with this video I will be drawing to a close with the Histories of Middle Earth. This is volume 12 in the final volume in the series by Christopher Tolkien and it is entitled The Peoples of Middle Earth and this book is largely, I would relate it to, um, if you've read the appendix or the appendices in the Return of the King, um, it's quite similar to some of the tales that you'll um, hear in there as far as the way it's written and how you how you read it. Um, it's got some interesting. It's, it's filled with interesting uh, little uh, details and aspects of uh, life, like um, some genealogies and and family trees of uh, the hobbits from the Shire. Uh, some of them, or one of them, was not published. It was printed, but not published. But it's contained within uh, this book, The Peoples of Middle Earth. And um, also, it has some really cool stories in it, um, entitled The New Shadow. And also, another one that I found particularly interesting is when the Numenorians came over the sea. It's told from the point of view of. Tar Elmar, or Tal El Elmar, sorry. Um, basically, that story is told from the view of the wild men of Middle Earth whenever the Numenorians um, came from uh, Numenor. I think it's close to the end ending of the uh, uh, when Numenor was uh, sunken under the ocean. Um, or perhaps, or actually, I think it was a little bit before because the Numenorians started coming or sailing to Middle Earth, um, you know, primarily in large numbers around the time of um, Aldarion. And um, and then also here, and it's really cool, you know, you see the story from a different point of view, but it was early on um, abandoned. You know, Tolkien didn't uh, write that much uh, about it but um and also the new shadow which is um probably one of my favorites tolkien didn't write much on this one um uh you know it's just a he started it but then he got to thinking to himself in like a letter he wrote later it's not worth doing that was what he wrote about it but i'll explain about that in in a little bit let's take a look at how it starts off so here's the contents you got the prologue and appendices to the Lord of the Rings. Then you've got some the appendix on the languages, uh, family trees. You have a lot of calendars, and you have the history of the Alcalabeth, which is, as we all know, the downfall of Numenor. Then we have some very cool stories. Um, the tale of the sec, the tale of the years of the Second Age, which compromises of. Um, various events during the second age then you've got the heirs of Elendil which are you know um the kings um like Asildor uh, Anarion and their and their trees and then you have the tale of the third the years of the third age which is basically uh leading up until the at the very at the end of that age to say you know the lord of the rings because the Lord of the Rings takes place in, um, well, it starts out, you know, early because, I mean, in the Fellowship of the Ring, it covers a large amount of time, especially the first couple of chapters. Because, you know, it mentions, you know, Gandalf is uh, away for nine years at a time, so on, so on and so forth. It starts out, Frodo is the age of 33, but whenever he comes in um, to be on his journey... He is about the age of uh, 52, I, I want to say. I might be wrong on that, so uh, double-check it, but I think he's around that age. So almost uh, 20 years. So the uh, probably, I think it starts out around 3,000 during the uh, the time that the first page of The Lord of the Rings was uh, written. And then, of course, in 3018 is when um, most of the... Well, I won't say most, but the ending of the uh, Fellowship of the Ring um, takes place. Um, well, actually, the ending of Fellowship of the Ring probably takes um, place during the beginning of 3019 because they stayed 
for a while in, in Rivendell until October, and then they stayed a while in uh, Lothlorien as well. So um, most of the Lord of the Rings actually takes place in 3019, the months, the, the months of January through March. And here you see you have the Tale of Aragorn and Arwen, the House of Errol, the Durance Folk. All those probably look familiar to you, and that's because here, the making of uh, Appendix A, which we see at the ending of the, um, the Return of the King after the story's over. And then <clears throat> part two, we see here of dwarves and men, of uh, Shibboleth and Fenor, the problem of Ross, and the Tolkien's last writings. Um, and then, of course, here you have the teachings of um, Pengalod and of Lambus. And those are some really cool chapters. Um, uh, this book, to me, the whole time I, I was reading it, I felt rather sad because almost everything there is to know about Middle Earth that I've read before, it's come to a conclusion with this, and that's it. But I mean, granted, you're going to have to read these books more than once to contain all their information. And even if you read them, you have to read them you know, at the level of a scholar, if you really want to understand, you know, in great detail, all the aspects of Tolkien's universe, because he wrote a lot. I mean, the man lived a long life, and he worked onwards from 1916 um, and years prior to that, not in um, great levels, but 1916 pretty much started. You know, that was during World War One, and think about how long ago that was, and he died in 1973. So, I mean, that was a long span of a writing that could be accomplished, and um, he did it. He did all this. But yet, uh, here with this book that Christopher Tolkien wrote, it, it, it comes to an end. Um, the one I'm working on now is The Letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, and um, they have a lot of cool things in them, like even from the beginning. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the coolest things that he wrote was um, he was writing to his soon-to-be wife about how he was developing his fairy language, and and look what that turned into, a, a real language. He stuck to it. But um, let's take a look now at the new shadow. I want to show you guys um, some of that. <clears throat> let's see, page 409. So basically what this story is about is that um, after the time of Ar Aragorn, uh, whenever he has gone and passed on and Arwen um, passed away, out of uh, the realm of Gondor, um, his son uh, Eldarion took over the throne um, of Minas Tirith. But sadly enough, during his time, um, evil started to creep back into the world. Is what Tolkien wrote, and he wrote that um, that a lot of uh, young boys in Gondor would run around with sticks pretending to be orcs and that seems like a huge like abomination um, or it would have been so to, to Aragon but uh, during this time they don't they don't understand what happened um, to these people you know during the year of 3019 and and onwards since the creation of of the Ainur and, and Sauron but it, it was t it took place about a hundred years after the downfall of Sauron. But um, okay, let's read this. But it proved both sinister and depressing. Since we are dealing with men, it is inevitable that we should be conquered with the most regrettable feature of their nature, their quick uh, satiety with good, so that the people of Gondor, in times of peace, justice, and prosperity, would become discontented and restless, while the dynasts descended from Aragorn would become just kings and governors like Denethor or worse. I found that even so early there was an outcrop of revolutionary plots about a center of secret um, satanistic religion while Gondorian boys were playing at being orcs and going around doing damage. I could have written a thriller about the plot and its discovery and overthrow, but it would be just that, not worth doing. And I feel like the reason Tolkien didn't go along with it was because, um, but it would be just that. 
and also about here about what it says with men would become discontented and restless. So it will become more repetitive. Like even though it, um, you know, he found the plot in his discovery, and he would overthrow it in that story, but just with the nature of men, it would keep happening again. So he thought it wasn't worth doing because you know it would just happen again later in uh his histories and just like in our day and time people are they're not content with um you know with good things sometimes after a while everything that's new gets old and people become restless but yeah here is the um the new shadow you see it's not that long you know he wrote a little bit of it and here <clears throat> starts the notes that Christopher Tolkien wrote on it and whatnot. Then you had the the Tar the Tal Elmar. This whole story has to deal with um uh, what I was telling you earlier. You know the wild men of Middle Earth when they first saw the Numenorean ships come out of the West over the great oceans. And um but yeah this is uh this wraps up the histories of Middle Earth guys. Um, it's sad, you know, that it's, it's come to an end, but all great things must come to an end, right? And see the family trees there? Let's look at those. I mean, it's just so much that Tolkien did. Brandy Bucks of Buckland and all this just seems like it could have been something real. I don't know. Me being a huge Tolkien fan, I mean, it's amazing that all this stuff that we have to um, to go over and and look and learn about, you know, the thoughts that went through Tolkien's mind, and and also his son Christopher Tolkien for putting all this stuff together, so we, it would be available to us because without him. We wouldn't have all these 12 volumes to, to read. We would be limited to, you know, The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion and Unfinished Tales and, you know, the other works that Tolkien did that weren't related to the histories of Middle-earth. But, um, but okay, guys, that's, um, that's pretty much it. That's the review of all 12 volumes of The Histories of Middle-earth by Christopher Tolkien. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned, uh, learned something, and... I hope that I spoke in a way that you could learn something from, you know, the things I said and and the things I showed you. Granted, I'm not the best speaker. I stutter a lot. Um, and, you know, my information, um, I try to be as accurate as I can, but, you know, we're human. We're faulty. So don't take my word for it. Get these books for yourself and and read over them. They're a great read if you're a true Tolkien uh, fan but um as always uh get on amazon.com and and look at these um because they're going to end up being your your cheapest um price there for sure so um but yeah this is the map of middle earth all this came out of tolkien's mind all of this it's amazing how much can come from one brain and be so well organized all right, well, I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you soon.